Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute, give uh, people another minute to settle into seats. So we have a few people coming in, then we'll get started. So please take a seat wherever it's comfortable. It's, it's all open seating. It's just like Southwest Airlines. <laughs> We're now seating the C group. OK, uh, so before we get started um, uh, formally, just a housekeeping issue. If you uh, would be kind enough to, in addition to putting your tray table in the upright and lock position and your seat back upright, if you could put your cell phones on mute or do not disturb or please never call me again, whatever category you like, uh, that would be much appreciated. We are recording tonight as we do all of our SETI talks, which you can find the entire series of over 400 talks on our YouTube channel, uh, cleverly called SETI Talks. And uh, we are also doing something uh, that should be very interesting and fun tonight for the first time, and that is we are live streaming tonight's talk on Facebook Live. So this is a little bit of an experiment. We'll see how that goes. But we've had frequent requests for uh, live streaming of these talks, so we're doing that for the first time tonight. So another reason why it's just helpful to have our cell phones on quiet. Uh, which I've already done because I'm usually the worst offender. Anyway, thank you for coming. Welcome to the SETI Institute's SETI Talks series. My name is Bill Diamond, the president and CEO of the SETI Institute, which is in Mountain View, California, right down the road. And we're delighted to have a wonderful talk tonight. Uh, this is, as uh, the slide says, the SETI Talks series is one of the outreach programs of the SETI Institute. And tonight's talk is Kepler K2 and Beyond the era of exoplanets has arrived. And uh, so we're looking forward to a wonderful talk and presentation and discussion and also some audience interaction this evening. Um, I've said before, to, for those of you who've seen some of our other talks on Kepler mission, I think it's one of the most profound um, missions that NASA has ever, ever launched because it has changed our perspective on our place in the universe unlike any other mission that NASA has undertaken. So it's really fantastic and wonderful to have our guest speakers with us tonight. Um, I'm wondering how many um, guests this evening are here for the first time. Oh, well, that's fantastic, quite a number. It's great to see you, welcome, and thank you for coming. Of course, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience too, and we always are happy to see our good friends uh, and regulars come back and visit us, but wonderful to see a lot of new faces and thank you so much for, for coming, especially because we have no popcorn and, and soda, and you're here anyway. So that's, that's really great. Um, I thought in particular, because I expected we might have a few new faces, I'll just give you a, a couple of minutes of perspective and context on the SETI Institute, who we are and what we do. Um, the SETI Institute is something that many people have heard of or seen in the movies of one kind or another, but not everybody knows it really exists. But we do. <laughs> and uh, so I'll just take a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. So we have three fundamental activities. We uh, are a research organization, we have an education center, and we have outreach. And our outreach is how we connect with the public at large and share the work we do. And uh, our research Im includes 75 scientists, PhD scientists, representing 22 disciplines of study and background and divided into six areas of research. Our education programs are typically government-funded programs. They're NASA, they're NSF programs. They include summer internships for college students. They include putting teachers on an amazing plane uh, that NASA runs called SOFIA that does airborne astronomy in the infrared. They include programs like a STEM uh, badge uh, education program for the Girl Scouts. So amazing programs in education and outreach includes radio programs, this lecture series, social media, et cetera. Um, our Carl Sagan Center for Research, as I mentioned, is divided into these six areas of research. They include astronomy and ax, uh, astrophysics, uh, exoplanets, which is tonight's category, climate and geoscience, planetary exploration, astrobiology, and last but not least, both radio and optical SETI endeavors. Um, our Center for Outreach includes our website, SETI.org, where you can get to know us and read fun and exciting new stories every day about the science, education, and outreach programs that we do at the Institute, keep up with, uh, with the work we do. We are very active on Facebook. We do a lot of uh, Facebook posts, typically every day. We're doing four or five posts. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, we're doing Facebook Live events. We have typically a weekly Facebook Live event um, that uh, usually gives the audience an opportunity to meet one of our scientists and learn about the work that they're doing. So that's a very active presence. We are also very active on Twitter. We're doing multiple uh, postings every day on Twitter. So if you want to keep up with what we're doing, you know, like us on Facebook and Twitter and follow us and visit our website and you can keep abreast of, of the amazing science that our researchers do and projects we undertake. SETI Talks is what we're here for tonight, uh, an important part of our outreach. And we also have a radio program called Big Picture Science. It's also available as a podcast, uh, but it's carried on NPR stations all across the country. It's a one-hour produced show, and it's a, it's a deep dive into a typical science, in, in a, to a given science uh, topic. Uh, it's not necessarily limited to the science of the SETI Institute. It's broader than that. We cover all aspects of science. It's a fun and, and engaging and wonderful program. So uh, be sure to check that out when you have a chance. And in our communications on the website every week, we're updating um, with something we call Where in the Worlds is SETI? Or Where in the Worlds have we been this past week? There's always lots of media coverage and stories about the work that we do and the work of our researchers and our colleagues at places like NASA, uh, Barry, and other uh, research institutes and academic institutes. So we cover that in a weekly, weekly update. If you sign up for our electronic newsletter, which you can do online, um, we have a monthly newsletter called Journey, which is sent to our, our followers. And that also has wonderful stories um, that are uh, about the work that we do at the Institute. Uh, we also have a magazine that we put out currently once a year. We're hoping to up that to twice a year. We'll have a new edition coming out for 2017, early next year. It's called Explorer. And that also gives you an opportunity to dive into some of the um, exciting projects that are undertaken at the Institute. Um, I do want to make you aware that you know, now this is our, our new home. The, the SETI series is now a monthly lecture series held at, at night. Our, the next talk is on January 23. Uh, we have talks already set up uh, for March, uh, February, March, and April with these dates. You'll, you'll be able to find these dates on our website. And of course, if you're registered uh, to get the emails about the lecture series, then you'll get information about these. Some of the topics that will be forthcoming, uh, we'll be doing a talk on planetary defense. This is the monitoring and characterization of near-Earth objects. Uh, otherwise known as asteroids, which uh, can ruin your day. They ruined the day of the dinosaurs um, 150 million odd years ago. Um, we'll be meeting Dr. David Newman, who was the former deputy administrator at NASA headquarters, a professor of engineering at um, uh, MIT. And she's uh, quite well known for her work in advanced spacesuit design technology. Um, SETI and STEM will be uh, an opportunity to meet some of the people in our education programs and who will share the amazing work that they're doing with Girl Scouts and other organizations to bring STEM uh, to a wider cross-section of the population. Um, and our own head of the Carl Sagan Center for Research at the SETI Institute, Dr. Natalie Cabral, will be talking about the coevolution of life and environment, how biology and environment are uh, uh, intertwined and inseparable, um, and she'll be giving that lecture. So, we're working on the schedule of which speakers are available for which dates, but again, all of that will be posted online, and we hope you'll continue to follow the series and, and come and join us here at SRI. And uh, by the way, we're very grateful as well for the, uh, for the partnership we have with SRI to put on this, uh, this wonderful lecture series. Um, so I'd like to get you to join us. Again, you can get to know us by visiting our website at SETI.org. Lots of information about the outreach programs, including the radio program, but also our science and research and education. So if you want to stay on, uh, abreast of what we're doing, then uh, check us out there. And I will now give you an unabashed um, word from our sponsors, which are basically you. Uh, this is the end of the calendar year. This is a very important time of year for the SETI Institute and other nonprofit organizations, which is what we are. Uh, and we look to get help from our followers and supporters to do things like put on programs such as the SETI Talks and the radio program, our SETI endeavors, which uh, have no government funding for them, and some of our other science. As we're sitting here nice and comfy in this warm room, one of our scientists, Dale Anderson, is in uh, Antarctica. He's diving uh, beneath frozen lakes at Lake Untersea, doing research on extremophiles, extreme biology, looking at cyanobacteria life forms under the frozen uh, Antarctic ice. And, uh, and uh, this research activity is, is uh, funded by philanthropic uh, interests. So if you'd like to, uh, to support us and get involved,
then you can just find the donate part of our website and we'd be very grateful for any support you're willing to, to give. And uh, right now, for new donors who give us $150, some of you may be aware of Jill Tarter, Dr. Jill Tarter, who's one of the founders of the Institute, also the inspiration for the character played by Jodie Foster in the movie Contact, and a SETI pioneer who, like Jodie's character, did her first SETI work at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. Um, a biography was written by Sarah Scholes and came out earlier this year about Jill's work and life. It's fascinating, and uh, we're giving copies away for that to, for, for new donors um, who are able to, willing to part with $150 in support of the Institute. So that's the end of my commercial introduction. And now, without further ado, I'd like to turn the podium over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Frank Marchis. He's going to introduce our speakers. He'll also serve as moderator for our discussion after their talk. So thank you very much for your attention. And Frank, welcome. OK, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I also have a 15 minutes presentation. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, I'm going to be very brief, that uh, we organized this uh, city talk with the topic of Kepler because Kepler, the mission Kepler, has changed drastically the way we do astronomy. And I think this mission deserves all the credits and all the attention from the public. So I'm very glad we have two amazing speakers to talk about the Kepler mission here. So I'm going to briefly give an introduction of uh, those speakers. The first one who's going to talk is Jeff Copling. He's an astrophysicist with the SETI Institute and the director of the Kepler K2 Science Office. He has been with the SETI Institute and the Kepler mission for the past five years. Uh, before this, Jeff wrote his PhD at the New Mexico State University studying exoplanet and eclipsing binaries using Kepler data. So Jeff is a, re is a true baby of, uh, of the Kepler mission. The second speaker uh, is Gert Berenson, an astrophysicist with the Bay Area Research Institute and NASA Ames. He's also the director of the Guest Observer Office for NASA, Kepler, and K2 missions. Um, before joining Kepler K2 in 2015, Gert had a, earned a PhD in astrophysics, astrophysics <laughs> from Queen's University, Belfast, in Ireland. Um, he works as a postdoc in the University of Earth for Shear. Thank you very much for putting this complicated name for a French person here, <laughs> where he studies star formation using narrowband photometry. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, first Jeff and later Gert. All right get my talk loaded up here. I am very excited to be here to talk to everybody about Kepler. As Frank said, I have basically grown up with it for most of my adult life, so I'm quite a fan. <laughs> All right, we're in business. Six, seven, six, five, four, All right, three, we don't have sound, but that's okay. Engine start. All right, so we'll start our journey. There we go. Lift off of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. So Kepler launched about eight years ago now, back in 2009. And so I was a grad student at the time, and I had just gotten uh, funding to do my dissertation on Kepler. So I was watching this with bated breath and just thinking to myself, please don't blow up, please don't blow up, please make it. And luckily it did. And Kepler, I think, has been a resounding success. Eight years later, we published our uh, final catalog of planets from the primary Kepler mission. K2 is going strong. Um, and so I'm really excited to share those results with you today. So you might have heard of this thing called the, the Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope, I think it's called. It's kind of kind of famous for the past 20 years, right? It is the best known space telescope. So Kepler is a lot like Hubble. It's a space telescope as well. It's out there in space, but it's got some unique things about it. Uh, one of the unique things is that Hubble stays very close to Earth, going around about once every 45 minutes. Kepler actually orbits the sun. It doesn't orbit Earth. And so you can see in this animation, Kepler is uh, a little bit smaller than this to scale. <laughs> Just a tad. But it, it orbits the sun, and it's been slowly drifting away from us ever since. And this is to get it into that nice, pristine, isolated environment where we can get really precise measurements. And so at this point now, it's actually about as far away from the Earth as Earth is from the sun. It takes almost a 16-minute round-trip light time just to talk to it. 
The other neat thing is you can see it spin every 90 days. And so Kepler has stared at the same patch of sky. It stared at the same patch of sky for over four years and kept turning so that its uh, solar panels could face the sun. So we just stared at one patch of the sky for over four years in an effort to find exoplanets. It's a very dedicated mission. So there's many ways to find exoplanets. The way that Kepler finds them is by the transit method. So we look at a star. We can't see the planet, but we can see the star. And when a planet goes in front, it blocks out a certain amount of light. So all we do is stare at a bunch of stars, and the ones that periodically dim on a regular basis, we know, hey, that must be due to a planet. The trick is, though, not every planet will pass in front of its star as we see it from Earth. Only, in fact, only a small percentage do. So that first system you saw, and nothing passed in front. This system is a little bit inclined, but still, no planet is passing in front of its star. Kepler cannot see those planets. If we look at this system, however, you see that the innermost one does transit. So we will see a drop in light, and we can detect it. But even in this case, the outermost planets still don't transit. So this is important to keep in mind of how Kepler finds them. So as I said, for over four years, we stared at one spot in the sky, and that was near the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. It's more of a summer constellation, so wait a few months before you can see it. But this is an actual full-frame image, the first light of Kepler superimposed on the sky. So if you hold your fist up, that's about the field of view that Kepler can see. And this is real data, real image, and pretty much every bright point you see is a different star. There's about over 20 million stars in Kepler's field of view that's visible by the telescope. And in fact, there's so many, we just don't have the bandwidth to download them all. We don't have a gigabit connection to the uh, spacecraft, unfortunately. And so this is still real data. You can see when you zoom in, you can actually see each individual pixel of the detector that the light falls on. And so we have to pick about 200,000 of the best stars to observe and download from the spacecraft. On the technical side, Hubble gives us nice pretty pictures. Kepler sure doesn't. This is an actual, what we call a pixel stamp from Kepler. So this is a star, and that's all we get. It's not very pretty to look at. But what Kepler does extraordinarily well is it measures the brightness on these pixels. They were some of the most well-engineered detectors at the time when they launched. And what we get is a light curve of the planet passing in front of the star as we see it from Earth. And this actually tells us a lot about the planet. How deep it is, how much light it blocks out, tells us how big that planet is relative to its star. And how long it takes to go around the star tells us how far away it is. So the longer it takes, the farther away that planet is from its host star. And if we know what type of star it orbits and how far it is, we can basically infer how much energy is received uh, at the planet's surface. And so this is a uh, planet called uh, uh, Kepler-10b. It was one of uh, Kepler's first rocky planets that was detected. Using follow-up observations, we're able to determine it's about 40% bigger than Earth. Uh, we're able to measure its mass, and so this thing has a density of almost 9 grams per centimeter squared. Earth is about 5.5, so this is a planet that is made up of a lot of heavy materials like iron. Think of a giant Mercury-type planet. On the technical side, a lot of the challenge over the past four years is that it's not always easy uh, to see a planet like that. And in fact, when we're hunting for Earth-like planets, the thing Kepler was uh, designed to detect, it, uh, what is the first mission that's able to detect Earth-like Earth planets, there's a lot of things that can fool us. So while we're looking for planets, there's things like brown dwarfs or really tiny stars uh, that can produce a transit that looks like a planet. You can have eclipsing binaries, two stars that are orbiting each other that can also mimic the signal of a planet. And it turns out that turning every 90 days, um, as precise as an instrument as Kepler is, the signal due to an Earth-like planet is so small that you have to look at wiggles on the detector. Um, in the electronics, there's lots of stuff out there that's trying to fool us into looking like planets that really aren't. And so what we've worked hard at the past several years is taking those 200,000 stars and we look for anything that looks like a periodic drop in light that could possibly be due to a planet. And we find about 34,000 of those signals. And we have to hunt and peck through every single one of those to find out, is this a planet or is it something fooling us? And only about 4,000 of those turn out to really be uh, very likely to be planets. Um, the spoilers out of those 4,000, we have found about 50 that we think are uh, terrestrial size and the habitable zone of their host star really exciting. Kind of on the fun technical end too is uh, to make sure that we were actually finding real planets. Uh, we took the original data and we injected simulated planets in there and see if we could recover them. So we inject a bunch of things that should be Earth and we find out, hey, how many of those do we actually detect? If we only detect one in ten, but we find one solid signature, that means that there were ten more we didn't see. So this is really important to Kepler's ultimate goal. So this was the state of exoplanets back in 2009, not even 10 years ago. 
So a little bit of history, the field didn't really exist 30 years ago. The first planet to be subsequently confirmed was detected in 1989. And so in 20 years of the field of exoplanets, we got about 100, maybe 200 planets um, before Kepler. This plot, we're showing the period of the planet. So one day, 10 days, 100 days, 1,000, Earth would be um, over on this side. And going uh, up to down on the y-axis, we have the size of the planet. So the big Jupiter-type planets are up here, and the small planets like Earth are over here. So Earth itself is one Earth radius and about 365 days. So you can see we weren't even close prior to Kepler. We stared for four years. We worked for another four hard on the data. And this is what Kepler has now been able to give us. So we have over 3,500 confirmed planets in total, and almost 20, over 2,300 of those are from Kepler alone. So Kepler has really revolutionized this field in pure numbers. Uh, we still have another two, over 2,000 candidates to go through to confirm. So the ones that are confirmed, we're like 99% sure of their planets. The ones that are just candidates are still 80% sure. So there are still uh, thousands of planets uh, waiting to be confirmed. But the main story is that we have now filled out this diagram. We have found all sorts of planets and have gotten some that are very close to being Earth analogs. The thing we're really interested in with Kepler, its unique capability is to find planets in the habitable zone. So for any kids in the audience, you've heard of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You want your porridge not too hot, not too cold, just right. For the adults in the audience, you want it not too malty, not too hoppy, just right. <laughs> Same thing with planets. If you're too hot, all your water boils off. If you're too cold, it freezes. Another thing to keep in mind is the size of the planet. If you're too big, you have a really massive, you're going to create tons of atmosphere and you're going to end up a gas giant, something that we don't really consider habitable as astronomers. Uh, on the converse side, if you're too small, you end up like Mars. You don't have enough mass to hold on to your atmosphere for an extended period of time, and you lose it. So you've got to be just the right size and just the right distance from your host star. We found about 50 of these that could possibly be rocky, not have a crushing atmosphere, and possibly have liquid water on its surface because it's the right uh, temperature. So what we're showing here is the amount of energy you get received from the planet. So 1.0, that's the same amount of energy that Earth gets from the sun. Over here is hotter, three times as much. Over here is a third. We're looking at the temperature of the star here. So the sun is about 5,800 Kelvin, a sun-like star. And these would be smaller and cooler stars from the sun. So hidden behind all these candidates of confirmed planets, you see Earth right there. Here's Venus, a bit hotter. Here's Mars, colder. Again, if Mars was bigger, it's still in the habitable zone. It could have liquid water on its surface. It's too bad. It was just a little too small. So you can see here what we've plotted is each one of these is a, either a Kepler candidate or a confirmed planet. So we have a bunch of planets up here around Earth that are almost the same size, receiving a similar amount of radiation from its star. And there's a bunch down here, too, that are also in the habitable zone. They're just around lower mass stars. So this is really just crazy exciting because all these planets in Star Trek and Star Wars, you see, really, they could be out there. These are the planets that could be habitable that we want to follow up um, over the next generations to come. I really, you know, I love seeing Kepler in the headlines, right? It's great to see the, the press cover it. Um, but I think they've missed kind of the most important point about Kepler and what we found. You always see headlines like, Kepler finds a habitable planet. Oh, this one's even more habitable. This one's even more Earth-like. And that's great to see in ones and twos. But the power of Kepler is in statistics. It's really a statistical mission. Because, again, related to the SETI Institute, we're trying to find out how common is life in the universe. And this is the famous Drake equation that says, if you want to find out the number of potential other civilizations out there that one day we might be able to come in contact with, you just got to know a couple simple things. How many stars are there in the universe? How many of those stars have planets? How many of those planets are like Earth? How often does life develop and develop into an intelligent civilization that can communicate with us? These are being worked on, but they're hard. The number of stars we've known for a long time. Kepler has really come in and been the first mission and the first time in human history where we actually know these two terms of how common planets are and how common, especially planets like Earth around stars like the Sun are. So what I'm showing here is the distribution of sizes of planets that Kepler has found. So these are the actual numbers we've detected of confirmed planets. And it turns out, yeah, we found some Jupiter-sized planets, but not many of them. As you go towards smaller planets, like Uranus and Neptune, several times the size of Earth, the numbers pop up. And then on this side, we fall down again, but we still found a lot of them. But that's because these types of planets, planets like Earth up here, are hard to find. They only impart a little tiny signal. So when you do the hard work that we've done over the past eight years to do the statistics properly, to take into account, 
you can say, what is the actual distribution of planets out there? And it turns out that small planets like Earth are incredibly common. The big planets like Jupiter, which are easy to find, they're actually pretty rare. We really are uh, basically, all, we're like breadcrumbs out there. There are just tons of rocky planets like Earth. And so this is a really exciting main result of the mission, just showing that as you go towards smaller planets, the number skyrockets. So we've put out all the data to determine what we call an occurrence rate, how common planets are. And we're really just at the start. We still have several years ahead of us to keep doing those statistics and get really hard answers. But what we can say right now for sure is that the range is somewhere between 2 to 25%. So maybe as much as 1 in 4 stars like the sun have a rocky planet like Earth in the habitable zone. We don't know if they have water. We don't know anything more than that. But they have the possibility to be rocky and to have liquid water on their surface. And so this is incredible if you think about it. If you do some numbers, there are about 150 sun-like stars within just 50 light years of the Earth, an incredibly small distance in, in galactic terms. And that means that even if our estimates at 2%, the smallest it could be, the lower limit, there's still at least three Earth analogs um, within 50 light years of Earth. And there could be as many as almost 40. When you extend this out to the entire galaxy, oops, you go to the entire galaxy and you consider that there are a billion, sorry, at least 100 billion stars in the galaxy, sometimes more, some people may say more. There's at least a million stars like the sun in the galaxy alone. If it's even 2%, the most pessimistic estimate, that's at least 20,000 planets that are rocky in the habitable zone out there. And really, there could be more, there could be, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of Earth-like planets. So this is the main takeaway from Kepler, something that we've wondered for all of humanity, how common are planets like Earth? We finally know, and the answer really is quite common. And with that, I will hand it off to Geert to tell you about K2. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Can I, I'm going to use my own laptop because I don't trust this laptop. Yeah, here, I so. I, I, <laughs> just give me a second while I uh, figure out how to connect the cable. I think it's, it's such a privilege to be involved with Kepler. For me, when I, for me, what Kepler has done is when I look at the night sky, and I know because of Kepler that there are more planets than stars. And so when I look at the stars in the sky, like I think about that. So the way I look at the sky with my own eyes has changed, and I think that's perhaps one of the biggest legacies of, of Kepler. So Kepler is this incredible success, right? There, for example, there are now 50 PhD theses written based on Kepler. That's 50 people, 50 young people who have spent four, five, six years of their lives doing nothing else but worry about the data to get these statistics, to get these results. 2,000 peer-reviewed publications. Um, but then it suffered a ball function. Back in 2013, um, Kepler launched originally with four reaction wheels, four gyroscopes, which, uh, like a spinning bicycle wheel, allowed the spacecraft to be stable, very stable. We need to have this exact pointing so that the exact same stars fall on the same pixels. That's one way we reduce the noise. Um, Kepler launched with four of those reaction wheels. Unfortunately, two of those were um, slightly suboptimal, and they failed. They actually also failed on a few other spacecraft. And the universe has three dimensions. So if you only have two reaction wheels, you can only stabilize two axes of your spacecraft. Um, the engineers tried for a while to do a few things to figure out if they could save two of those reaction wheels. They tried to uh, give them a bit of rest, hoping that the oil in the reaction wheels would lubricate. Um, they did all the best they could, and they couldn't make it work. We could no longer point to the Kepler field. The Kepler mission was removed from the budget of NASA. So people generally thought that was the end. But there was not accounting for a guy in Colorado called Doug Weimer, who none of you probably know, and, and I only met him recently, uh, who, inspired by sailboats, came up with the most insane way to make the spacecraft work anyway. He figured out that while we could stabilize two axes of the telescope with the two remaining reaction wheels, what we couldn't do is stabilize the roll, the rolling motion of the spacecraft. He figured out that if we would point the solar panels 
of the spacecraft to the sun in such a way that the radiation pressure, the photons from the sun, would hit this spacecraft in such a way that their combined forces would balance, that we could still have a stable third axis. This is like one of NASA's biggest hacks. Like this is, <laughs> I, that's what I call it. I, was I, I kept saying this for a while, then I was reminded that Apollo 13 happened, and you know, that's a pretty good hack. Um, <laughs> But, but this is a great hack. The, the, some of the headlines, like... <laughs> some of the headlines... Because uh, it's not magic. This is what, when people study to become engineers and spend their lives uh, dealing with math and doing incredibly difficult things, you get people, uh, senior engineers, who just don't use magic. They just use maths and they make it work. So, Kepler is back in business. Kepler is no longer looking at the field of Insignus. Um, because of the observing constraints, because we have to point the solar panels in just the right way to the sun, and we have to, uh, as Kepler rotates around the sun, we have to sort of uh, re-rotate it every uh, 90 days in a certain way to keep, keep in balance. We can no longer point at the Kepler field. What we can do is point in the ecliptic plane. And so for the last three and a half years, Kepler has embarked on this big survey uh, of the plane in the sky, which uh, is home to our planets. While we can no longer study the planets that Jeff was uh, discussing, what this has enabled is, is to do um, more of our galaxy, because we now study with this fantastic instrument more directions in the sky than we uh, did before. And for some people, this was a blessing. Uh, people like me actually specifically joined the project to make this work. Everything we do when it comes to making these observations work is a hack. You know, the mission was never designed to do this, and um, it took some effort, but now we are studying these different corners of the galaxy. I just took one example from a recent campaign where uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Seven Sisters, one of the most notable objects in the sky. Uh, it's in the ecliptic. We observed it with Kepler. When we take images, they don't look nice. That's not a point. We leave that to Hubble. We get the best... Uh, you've, you've heard of that mission, Jeff, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know Frank can't pronounce it, but it's fine. Um, so what Kepler does is Kepler makes movies. Kepler makes uh, incredibly high time resolution movies with a, a, a precision that's unrivaled by any other space telescope or instrument on Earth. So we make movies of these stars, and if you would plot this data using time on the x-axis and the brightness of the star on the y-axis, then uh, when you study the seven sisters in the Pleiades, the seven bright stars that make up the Pleiades, you see these insane variations in their light. This was never seen before. This is new. Uh, because the precision here, this is less than a percent uh, of intensity variations uh, are not able to be seen from Earth. What's going on here is that these are all B-type stars. That means they're hot, young stars. And stars, just like Earth in some ways, have quakes, star quakes, they pulsate. They pulsate because a star is not a uh, constant body, there are motion, there, there is motion of big gas bubbles, there are uh, radiation zones which heat gas, you get convection. Um, and so all of that causes stars to, to, to tremble. Um, I won't go into any detail there, but people can actually, from those pulsations and from the frequency of those pulsations, can model uh, the interior structure of stars. There's a whole scientific discipline just devoted to understanding how stars work based on data like these. So uh, we got better insights into the Pleiades. One exception is Maya. One of the seven stars is different. It turned out it had a big chemical spot of mangane on its surface. Just uh, an interesting story there. Um, manganese, that's what I meant to say. Um, there's actually many stars in the Pleiades. It's a big cluster of a few hundred stars. Uh, another thing Kepler can do is, by taking its measurements, it can measure the rotation rate because spots on the surface will show this periodic signal, as we see in Maya there, this sinusoidal signal. Um, Kepler has revolutionized for this and many other clusters uh, our data sample of watching stars as a function of their color, which is a proxy for temperature, as a function of their temperature and mass, uh, we've been studying how fast stars rotate, and this gives us new insights. You see stars that are red, which means they're very low mass, somehow spin faster. There's now a whole industry of people working on explaining why this is. 
because we're looking in the ecliptic, which is home to our planets and our um, asteroids, we see all these like minor bodies. We, we actually happen to observe the largest unnamed body in our solar system uh, recently. It's called 2007 OR10. Um, it's incredibly faint, so you have to sort of uh, do some effort to see the object moving through our pixels. Data is good enough to get the rotation period. So now we know how fast the largest unnamed body in our solar system, it's like a thousand miles wide, it's not even small. It's going to get a name soon. Uh, just like a fun fact, we studied it, we figured out that it rotates surprisingly slowly. There's a few reasons why that might be the case. One of them is if it has a moon, then often objects with moons tend to rotate more slowly because some of the angular momentum is in the moon. Turned out we looked at the archive Hubble images and we found the moon around this object. <laughs> Cutting edge science, which Kepler is enabling, um, which is not something you typically do with a broken spacecraft. <laughs> Uh, much of our current focus, and this is like hot of the press, next week we are starting a campaign where for 90 days we're going to be looking at 10,000 galaxies, 10,000 other Milky Ways, if you will. We know that statistically 20 of those will show a supernova explosion. We are going to look at them in the highest time resolution that anybody has ever observed, supernovae explosions. This will give us insights into uh, fundamental physics. I can give an entire talk on this subject alone. Shall I? No, I will not. <laughs> um, but I'm getting off, uh, off tangent now. I'm showing you all this amazing science that uh, Kepler is doing. And it's back in business. And it's so exciting. It's also still doing exoplanets. We look at this uh, bigger sample of stars. We don't look at stars for four years. We only look at them for three months. But we look at now 16 different directions in the sky, meaning we have access to more stars. And that means we have access to more bright stars more nearby stars. Um, this is just a fun little animation where the circle shows the sky and yellow dots will appear at positions where Kepler found planets. So in the first years uh, of the mission, we have planets appearing in the Cygnus field. And right now, this sample is being complemented with all these other planets across the sky which this thing is finding. And let me tell you, we haven't even found you know, half of what we think will eventually come out of the data, especially in the later fields which just haven't been available to the public for uh, as long as the original data. So let me just finish by saying um, Kepler is still in business. We see more stars. That means we are finding right now, this year, planets around stars that are brighter. I'm showing here the distribution of K2 planets, uh, so extended Kepler mission planets against the total sample of planets we know. And K2 is really finding planets around brighter stars. This is important because um, if you have a bright star with a planet passing in front, some of the light of these bright stars, so many photons, will be passing through the atmosphere of those planets. This is exactly the tool which, in the near future, it will hopefully give us more insights into the chemistry, right? We're actually moving now from, you know, when Kepler was launched, it was a genuine question, are Earths common? Right? We, like, we knew there were these Jupiters. We didn't know if Earths were common. And now we know Earths are everywhere. And now we're, the field has moved on to asking, what are those planets made of? Um, so by using the technique where you look at light passing through the atmosphere of transiting exoplanets, we can get spectroscopy. Um, this is another entire talk, but to make a long story short, you can try to detect uh, elements, especially molecules with big absorption bands. CO2, methane, uh, water are some examples of molecules with big uh, absorption bands. When light passes through at certain wavelengths, those wavelengths will tend to be um, absorbed. And this is something that the community of astronomers is going to attempt uh, to achieve with uh, NASA's biggest ever space telescope, called the James Webb Space Telescope, due for launch in about a year and a half. Um, it's got instruments on board, which are partly designed specifically to help us understand the chemistry of planets. Not only are the stars that we are now, the planets that we are now discovering brighter because we are looking at the bigger part of the sky, there's also just more nearby stars because we look at more of the sky. And so we've been finding planets that are closer. This is important because when a planet system is really nearby 
and we take the highest resolution possible data using special techniques to block out the central light of the star, uh, we can actually see planets move. This, this only works for very nearby systems, but it works. Um, we're still at the stage where this only really works for big planets that are far away from their stars, so it does not work for an Earth-like planet yet. Um, but again, NASA is developing the technology we need to uh, enable this. Uh, one, one method being uh, worked on is the star shade technology, the idea of um, flying a big shade 50,000 miles in front of your telescope to block out the light of a star so that you can just see the planets next to it. This isn't science fiction. This is a laboratory in Pasadena, California at NASA JPL where the technology is being developed and tested to figure out how these big structures can be um, assembled in space. So let me end by saying that Kepler, unfortunately, isn't going to be with us for much longer. Uh, in the next few months, it will actually run out of fuel. <laughs> you know, and it's in fact not just the fuel. It's a spacecraft that is now well beyond its design lifetime. It's done its job, done a fantastic mission. Uh, it is going to end probably March, April of next year, very soon. Um, but exactly around that time, we'll get a new satellite called the TESS satellite, which has a bunch of wide-field cameras to survey the entire sky so that we have a survey of all the nearby bright star planets to go and study the chemistry of planets. Because now we know there's planets everywhere. We just need to catalog them all. Um, and something I find exciting being in Silicon Valley is that actually the number of exoplanets we know and are discovering actually follows an exponential trend. <coughs> Just like Moore's law, which asserts that the number of transistors in the CPU uh, doubles in a certain uh, time frame. This is happening with exoplanets. And if you look at the future and our future facilities and telescopes, this is going to keep happening. It's really exciting. So very soon, a new planet will well, know millions in a few years. That, that's my prediction. Um, so NASA is developing a suite of missions, technologies to uh, ultimately get back to the answer, which, of course, the SETI Institute cares about, which is, are we alone? It's a question that I care about, and I believe we will find out. Thank you. Wow. So I had a lot of questions, and in fact, you answered to most of my questions. So I'm going to look kind of, uh, I'm going to make up some questions. Um, you, but when I hear you talking about you, this mission, when I hear you talking about your work, it seems there is a lot of passion in what you're doing. I'm not going to talk about the science, ask for about science yet, but I want to, you to tell us a bit more about what is it for you to work for this mission, with this mission? What, what's your daily life or how you manage this team? How many people work at the moment on Kepler and K2? Give us a bit of the background and the story of the people. Sure, so I think we have people from all backgrounds. We have everyone from the engineers um, that built the uh, spacecraft, um, awesome men and women at Ball Aerospace. We have the people that operate it on a daily basis um, out in Boulder, Colorado that talk to it um, every, uh, every time we can to keep a spacecraft health in check. Uh, we have the people um, uh, with SETI Institute and with NASA Ames that uh, get the data down from the spacecraft. We process it. We put it out to the community. Uh, we have people that go through to find the planets, the people that use data for other astrophysics, uh, and, uh, and then the people doing the statistics to find out how common planets are. Uh, you know, day to day, I think it's a, it's a job like any other. It's, um, it's a team job. We have a lot of meetings, uh, uh, make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, it, it makes yeah. me very humble because the people we get mm -hmm. to work with are amazing people who have done a lot of hard work. Like, for example, two of our senior engineers, they're the same people who made the Galileo lander land in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Uh, and our mission director actually was involved yeah. in Pioneer 10, who went to take the first picture of Jupiter. These are the sort of people that we get to work with. It's humbling. Yeah. Okay, and about the data. So. Um, I'm an astronomer. In my case, I work on the GPI project. So we get observation every, I would say, every month, like three or four nights of observations. You have a lot of data coming, right? 
Uh, do you inspect them visually? Do you run algorithm for that? Do you argue about the data? We argue a lot about our data oh, yeah. on GPI. <laughs> so I wonder, I'm sure for you it's not the case, right? Everything is perfect or... Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, no problems ever, yeah. <laughs> So tell us a bit about how do you decide when something will be publishable or it's interesting, for instance. What's the, what's the criteria that you use for that? It's so, actually very different from Kepler and K2, so maybe you want to talk about Kepler? Sure. So I think uh, on the Kepler side, we're really focused on the statistics. We wanted to do everything, uh, kind of put blinders on and do it uniformly so we weren't biased. So we weren't really hunting and pecking for individual planets. Uh, we wrote a lot, of, a lot of software and a lot of algorithms to go through and uh, robotically, automatically search the data for planets, again, with those blinders on, so we could really measure exactly the, the occurrence rates. Um, so yes, yeah, so really a lot of uh, machine learning, data processing uh, went on. So, so Kepler had a, had a mission, had a goal, which had a well-designed sort of setup of how are we going to achieve this, what do we need. K2 just happened, right? It wasn't designed by anyone. So what we did is we thought, you know, NASA, the few engineers that work for Kepler aren't perhaps smart enough to figure out how to do this. Let's ask everybody in the community of astronomers, how do we make this work? So every target we observe is requested through peer review by astronomers in the community. And the first thing we do when we get data down through the deep space network antennas uh, every three months is the first thing we do is we put it on a public web server where everyone, and I mean everyone, like you don't have to be an astronomer, where everyone can download it. So often we are not even the first to look at the data anymore. Uh, often I will tweet saying, uh, the data is live from the, lot of, from the last three months, and within like six hours, somebody will tweet a new planet. That's, that's how the situation we're now in. So that means that everybody can inspect Kepler data anytime and make discovery. Anybody in this room who has the knowledge or the interest can basically spend time to look for asteroids, comets, or maybe look at uh, some of the non or a non transit. That's true yeah. to some extent, but it's hard because you need a lot of technical knowledge. So something we're investing a lot of time in right now is writing tutorials and tools because we actually want to open it up even more. But there is a great website called uh, Planet Hunters um, that started in the early days of Kepler. And because they knew that we were focused on the original, on the prime Kepler mission of that uniformity and doing everything in an automated fashion, that we were going to miss a lot of stuff, and we did. And so uh, this is a team of, and it really ranged from people that had some astronomy background to people that had none. Um, and they gave tutorials, they helped each other out, and they actually found and published many planets that, uh, that we missed with the automated fashion. And, and some of these were missed because they had unique quirks about them, so they turned out to be some really fascinating uh, objects that we wouldn't have found if the, the you know, world community at large didn't go and look for them. And I expect that'll happen still. As Geert said, all the data is public, so people will keep hunting and pecking over the next many years and keep finding new discoveries. So can you describe one of these interesting discovery made with Kepler or with those? Yeah, I think uh, one of them was a, uh, one of the first ones was a planet around a uh, binary star system. And so you had two stars that were orbiting and eclipsing each other. And then out here, you had another planet orbiting both of them. And so instead of having a nice regular light curve where you'd see a dip in exactly another you know, year or whatever its orbital period was, dip a year later, like we were expecting, you would see sometimes two dips in a row if the stars were like this. Or if the stars were like this, you might get one big elongated dip. And so it was a very non-repeating pattern, something we didn't pick up with the code. But the human eye looked at it and went, whoa, there's something going on there. Um, I'm going to look closer and figure it out. Some people call it the Tatooine planet, because in Star Wars, you have a planet with two <laughs> stars. <laughs> OK, um, I have a few more questions, and then we're going to open the, the floor for questions for the public. Um, you, let's assume that. Uh, someone give you an infinite amount of money and uh, give you uh, uh, as a task to build another Kepler. What will you do? What, what will you change in the mission to make it more efficient, more interesting? What will be the goal? Put a few more reaction wheels on. That's <laughs> that wouldn't hurt. I disagree. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Oh, man, I would... Uh, I just launched another one right now. I mean, again, in the original field, we got four years, but uh, you know, when you're finding Earth-like planets, you have to wait one whole year to get a transit. So over four years, that means we only got three or four transits, which is great. We, we, we met our mission goal, um, but when you start to get six, seven, eight, you can probe even smaller than Earth. You can be really sure and confident that's a planet. 
Um, and then that was just, you know, you hold your fist up, that was this much of the sky. That's all we got. So although we are launched on the TIS mission, um, a whole fleet of Keplers to get the entire sky and find every planet that's out there would be incredible. I mean, one of the reasons that we have an exponential increase in number of exoplanets is that a lot of astronomy is driven by technology. So the size of our detectors and the size of our computing ability and everything is, is really just Moore's law. And so even if you would do the same mission today with a similar budget, you'd get more power. Okay, and if I give you the names like uh, Chaos, Tess, Plateau, Ariel, Finesse, all those missions are basically the future mission to explore exoplanet by transit. Uh, are you involved in those missions? Or are you planning to be involved in any of them? Nah, sounds boring. No, I would, I would <laughs> never do anything You're like going that. back no. to uh, doing yeah, uh, right. something more interesting? Yeah, no, I, uh, a lot of people from Kepler, uh, including myself, are starting to get involved with the, uh, the test mission because it is very similar to Kepler. And in instead of staring at one patch, they're doing an all sky. So uh, you know, we're transferring a lot of that expertise we learned with Kepler over to TESS um, and, and similar missions going forward. I think especially with these future exoplanet missions, mm -hmm. so many of Kepler's people that made Kepler happen have moved on. And so it's really NASA is really trying to make sure we reuse all, everything we've learned and our technology to, you know, because we will reach more in the end, right, if we all OK. Do so we can take some questions from the public. There is microphones. Uh, there is one here, and maybe a second one somewhere else. So please, don't be shy. <laughs> They're not going to bite you, hopefully. <laughs> Depends on the question. <laughs> Did you eat before coming? <laughs> Hi. If uh, K2 only is staring at a plot, uh, period of space for three months, how are you able to detect planets unless the orbital period is like significantly less than three months? Excellent question. We are not. We are not able to find planets that have uh, very long, year-long orbits. Except we're now actually, on next Thursday, we start to observe a field in the sky that we have visited uh, two years ago with K2. So in that field, actually, we might be able to. So there are a number of planets that have, like, one-month orbital periods? There are planets like that. There are billions of planets like that. Yeah. yeah. The early days of astronomy, that was just, uh in 1989 and the early 90s, when people found the first planets, they were so skeptical because they were like, this thing would have to be the size of Jupiter and in a one-day orbit. I mean, Mercury, we think of as close, and it takes 80 days to go around. One day, you were almost hugging the surface of that star. So they went, this must be an artifact. This can't be real. This can't be real. It turns out it's real. There's any type of planet you can really imagine. I think we found it. <laughs> it's a zoo out there. Yeah. <laughs> mentioned that you're competing for time on the Deep Space Network. You don't have a one gigabit link back to the spacecraft. You're probably power constrained. So the sun shield is one way to make your sensors more sensitive. How are you thinking about the changes that are going to happen in the comms technology? So maybe it's optical relay, or maybe it's building a commercial Deep Space Network that allows more time on the network. How much data are we losing right now that's locked on the spacecraft that we're not able to have access? And then what kind of onboard processing are you doing to try to make that comms link more efficient? So the, maybe the, I'll, I'll say the bad news, you say the good news. Okay. <laughs> so the bad news is we can only download like two or three percent of our pixels mm -hmm. because we are one AU away, we're more than a hundred million miles away. Because, and because K2 has this funny way we, we point it, we, our telemetry during a campaign is 10 bits per second with, with the biggest antennas of the DSM. Um, but we download the best pixels. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Jeff here, who is definitely not a telecom engineer, will tell you how the telecom uh, technology is Oh, that's right, yeah. No, I, I will say that it's a great point, though, right? So just we can check in the general spacecraft health with that, with that low-down link. Um, but about once a month, uh, well, during the Kepler mission, about once a month, and K2, once every uh, three months, uh, we take the fixed antenna here and point it back at Earth, and then we're able to get a, uh, a broadband connection. It's decent. <laughs> you can watch videos. Yeah. You'd have to talk to our engineers to mm -hmm. understand the technology yeah. there. I, I know one option early on was to have a gimbaled antenna so that we could constantly be in communication with Earth. Uh, but that was going to be expensive. It could have possibly broken. I mean, moving parts are the things that tend to break. The only moving parts are the reaction wheels, and those are the two we lost. And it's more time on the Deep Space Network, so that's either less time for other missions or more expensive uh, to you. So I guess going back to your question, if we had an unlimited budget, that's one thing we could have done. But we were smart. Most of space is empty, so we really did target the pixels that had the most interesting stars to look at. So even though we only got 2 or 3% of the pixels, I think we still got 90% of the science. Absolutely. 
Uh, I wanted to ask about the SETI part. Have you guys, or anyone you know of, looked for alien megastructures, starship drives, that sort of thing, in the Kepler data or other data? What kind of alien activity could potentially be hiding in there? Who's done the math? Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen some really interesting papers where, uh, you know, we look for a round spherical planet passing in front of a star. Um, but if you assume some other civilization out there might have something that's a square or a triangle or some odd shape. And so people have uh, certainly computed what would it look like for a giant triangle going in front of a star to look like. Um, and so people have searched the Kepler data for that. They, they haven't found anything that matches, um, surprising. But uh, you know, there's the star called Tabby Star that was really exciting at first because we didn't have a good astrophysics explanation to, uh, to start. I think we got some good, good astrophysical theories now, but it's still, uh, it's still not completely solved. Um, so yeah, certainly any big survey like this where you're getting lots of data, you're looking at a lot of stars, you never know if one of them is going to show an anomaly that we just can't explain by any other means except for another civilization. Hasn't happened yet, but could happen. I, I think for me the, the reason, um, the, the, the biggest contribution to Kepler here is that we now know there's planets everywhere, and now I think it's criminal that we're not looking for it with a proper budget. So you should all donate to SETI and make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Gert. Uh, I'm particularly interested in supernova light curves. How many of you managed to collect uh, in the K2 mission compared to how many you found before K2? And what is the significance of a complete supernova light curve? Thank you. So during the prime mission, where we had a few galaxies in the field, we had about eight or nine, I believe, supernovae. Uh, two nature papers coming out, came out of it. Because when you look at a supernova, and the, the key is we look at thousands of galaxies continuously. So we don't know where the explosion will happen. That means that we will be looking at it before the supernova goes off. And what that tells you is in the first hours, um, as, as a white dwarf, for example, explodes, it might be interacting in those crucial first hours with whatever uh, stars perhaps were around it. So one uh, pathway to an explosion like this is a big red giant star accreting material onto a white dwarf which then gets so much material that the gravity is no longer supported by the fusion. Long explanation, but to make a long story short, in those first few hours of an explosion, if we see a blip suggesting that the shock wave of the um, explosion has hit a nearby red giant star, we can actually figure out what went, why the explosion happened in the first place, which is not something we can do now. And so these Kepler supernova light curves have more data points in them than all these supernova light curves ever taken before Kepler. So that's how we are changing the, this particular area in the place. I'm happy to talk more offline about it. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned that only uh, two to three percent of the pixels are being used. Now I'm not assuming it's the same set on the, on the array, but has this at all impacted decision making for future missions in terms of, well, could we just build a smaller, could we save a ton of money by only building like 5% of the pixel space and then use the other, you know, rest of the budget for something like you guys want? Like, So the, uh, the actual, the, the digital imagers, the CCD part is probably one of the cheaper things on the spacecraft. You know, again, most of the budget is, is getting it up in space and operating it. Um, so it never, it never hurts to, to, to build a big camera and throw some pixels away. Um, but, yeah, to that point of can we use them all, uh, the test mission is going to every 30 minutes download the entire image. So TESS, when it does the whole field uh, of the sky survey, you will have every pixel downloaded every 30 minutes. So if there's a star there, you'll probably be able to find every transiting planet basically in the entire, in the entire sky down within a certain orbital period and a certain size. But it will be very complete. My name is Bill Boulder. I also work at Ames uh, on the Kepler and TESS missions, as well as Sophia. And um, I, when you guys were talking about putting the data out there, um, I heard a lot of people in the uh, audience get pretty excited about that. And since this is uh, Silicon Valley, uh, you might also be interested in the software. Uh, there's a million lines of Java and MATLAB code to do all the data analysis, find the planets, do the calibration, and do the validation that these guys have been talking about. Uh, before we got the data actually to the scientists to do the, um, to reduce it further, to, to deal with, we, we would give them to candidates to work with. Um, but that source code is available. It's on github.com slash NASA slash Kepler dash pipeline. That's github.com slash 
Kepler, uh, NASA slash Kepler dash pipeline. So the code is up there for people to review and check out. Thank you. Yeah, if you want to talk to somebody who's in the guts and has worked incredibly hard to do all the hard work of getting the data processing out there, Bill is the guy to talk to. <laughs> Maybe you can fix your laptop. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it lost a reaction wheel. That's what happened. Yeah. Um, we've been finding uh, extremophiles and more and more life in more and more surprising places on the planet. Does this mean our Goldilocks zone is increasing? Are we looking for smaller stars that are colder because we found life on Earth in these similar situations? So I, I yeah, it's, it's tricky talking about habitability um, in general because, you know, there's some people out there who think anything outside of California isn't habitable, you know. <laughs> it's, not, it's not 70 and sunny? Oh, can you really live there? I don't know about that, right? And so as astronomers, we really focus, I think, on the principal thing of, is there liquid water? Because even with the stream of files on Earth, the one thing we've found is an absolute necessity for, for life so far seems to be there must be liquid water. And everywhere on Earth we seem to find liquid water, we find life in it. Um, and so that's when we show these plots of the habitable zone. We're really going, what's the extreme that it could be just up until frozen, and what's the extreme that it could be just up until boiling? And anywhere in between, we, can, we consider habitable and, and life could exist. Maybe there's a form of life that doesn't need liquid water. Um, and so if that is the case and we, we, we figure that out one day, then yeah, then certainly our, our habitable zone gets bigger. Okay, we have one more question here. Just to follow up on that same concept, uh, as you know, Europa probably has liquid water and I don't think it shows up in habitable, habitable zone. So any comment on that kind of thing? Well, there's actually a whole industry about um, the question of habitability. It's incredibly hard. One aspect of it is uh, we have a postdoc at, at, uh, at NASA called Andrew who's working, who has a history in modeling the climate of Earth. Um, and he's taking those models and applying them to exoplanets because now you sort of know the budget of, of uh, energy from their star coming in. And it's incredibly difficult because things like the greenhouse effect and distance to the star and everything and the chemistry of your atmosphere can all make um, places in the universe habitable or not. And for me, this is fascinating because it reminds me that ultimately the reason we study these exoplanets isn't necessarily because of the exoplanets, but because of we care about Earth and we, it allows us to put Earth's uh, habitability and climate into context. But it's a, it's a great point. There are other energy sources than the sun alone. Like Europa, you can have tidal heating and stretching. You can have radioactive decay in the core. Um, and so, yeah, certainly we shouldn't necessarily rule out any place in particular. We just got to look at what we know is the most likely. Um, but I'm, I'm sure we'll be surprised where we find other life one day. I often tell kids at outreach events that there could be space whales swimming under the surface of Enceladus, one of these other moons that has liquid water. Now, we don't know, but I think it's criminal that we haven't looked yet. Like, why, why aren't we there looking, drilling a hole? Mm -hmm. And this is something we discuss a lot at the SETI Institute, and you're going to have a lot of different talks on this topic in the future. So. Of course, please uh, follow us and you will hear some of our scientists talking about those crazy ideas of extreme, extreme life on Enceladus and Europa. You wanted to add something, Bill? <laughs> so either we get the popcorn going or, or we let people go home. <laughs> but um, uh, I, first of all, I'd like to give a big round of applause to uh, Geert and to Jeff for this wonderful talk. I think they, they both validated my comment at the beginning of this, which is that uh, Kepler is really one of the most profound missions in the history of NASA, I think. Uh, it's really changed our perspective on who we are and where we fit into the, the greater cosmos, um, like no other mission. And uh, it is kind of sad, you know, you could hear, you know, an audible, oh, <laughs> in the audience, and you said, it's going to be ending soon, it, you know, well, like, like our cars, you know, eventually runs out of gas, runs out of fuel, and, and the mission comes to an end. But um, as mentioned, the data will be out there to explore and, and examine for a long time. Probably many more PhD theses will be written on the Kepler data. Uh, and of course, Tess is coming and James Webb is coming. Um, and to the point of, uh, that they were talking about with respect to citizen access to the data, uh, not that this was your average citizen, but it was a young woman, a young astronomer from Yale, not yet with her PhD, who discovered the Tabby star that we spoke about earlier. This is the star that has that incredible light curve that dips by 
Now, that's a very big object that would make the light of its host star dim by 20 percent. And although there are a lot of credible theories, none of them has really stood up to say, yep, this really must be it. So we don't know uh, whether that's an alien megastructure or some natural phenomenon. It's perhaps more likely to be natural in its origin, but a fascinating subject. And, and of course, to that wonderful question about um, you know, what are the implications of this mission uh, for SETI endeavors and for the SETI Institute, um, I think that, uh, that Jeff talked about you know, how those two variables of the Drake equation um, N sub E and F sub P, we now have, we know a lot about. We know every star has planets and that the fraction of stars with planets, Earth-like planets in the habitable zone is a, an astronomically large number in our own galaxy. Um, so I think it does compel us for the search to continue and maybe to continue now more with Ernest. Um, it also means that for instruments like the Allen Telescope Array at the SETI Institute, we have actual places to point it now that can be interesting. The TRAPPIST system that made the headlines uh, some months ago, this system of, is it seven or nine? Seven, seven planets around a, a red dwarf star, three of which appear to be in the habitable zone of that star. We now know their orbital periods. We can actually wait for those planets to line up in a so-called conjunction. Maybe there's communication happening between these planets. They're very close to one another compared to the planets in our solar system. So we, we have fun and interesting science to be done based on how much more we know now than we did before the Kepler mission that engages uh, the endeavor of SETI. And the ability that will be forthcoming to probe planetary atmospheres with James Webb is going to be extraordinary. Uh, that's ultimately a SETI endeavor. Uh, we're looking for biosignatures. We're looking for indications of signs of life. Um, and uh, you, it was a great question about um, uh, you know, what, are the, what are the ongoing efforts that can be undertaken? What are some of the topics as well that relate to this uh, from the SETI domain? And uh, we talked about habitability when, when uh, Natalie Cabral comes to speak with us about the coevolution of life and environment. There will be a lot of discussion there about habitability and what that means. And, uh, uh, and looking at systems like Mars, for example, instead of looking at it in terms of habitability and habitat, looking at it as a, uh, as a biosphere, as a system that is a dynamic system that has changed since it, it first appeared in our telescopes and we first began to study it for, since it first existed and now. So uh, lots of interesting things out there. Please do check out the SETI, to, uh, SETI Talks uh, YouTube library. Again, there's, there's 400 lectures there. Many of them relate to some of the topics that we discussed tonight and some of the questions you asked, which were brilliant. So uh, please do check that out uh, again. And um, uh, you gentlemen both have the very famous and rare, um, I think they're going for a million dollars on eBay now, the SETI Talks Speakers Mugs, which we will be giving you tomorrow for, at the Institute. Uh, we have uh, Kepler and K2 stickers for you tonight, however. <laughs> so uh, thank you again, gentlemen, for a wonderful talk. Thank you, Frank, for, for hosting. And thank all of you for coming and joining us. Thanks very much.